Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, for joining. Um, you are in the right place if you're here um, for Plant Life's Fall Into Nature on the Road to Success um, panelist event tonight. We'll just give you a few more minutes um, for everybody to join because we're expecting um, a lot of you tonight. Um, but um, yes, make yourselves comfortable at home and we'll begin in a few minutes time. Good evening again to everybody who's joining us. Um, I hope you can see our main plant live screen okay. Um, as we're in a, a webinar set up um, this evening, you can only see us panelists um, and the screen in front of you rather than um, seeing all of the attendees um, as well. So don't worry about that, but hopefully you can see and hear us okay um, and, and see our main presentation screen for, for the presentations later. and. We're just waiting for a few more people to join and then we'll get started at, at just after half past six. So hopefully you should um, all be able to hear us and see us okay. Um, you should as well have on your screen um, some buttons at the bottom, uh, the, the Zoom Q&A function. If you have any questions tonight for us and the panelists, um, please put those questions in the Q&A. If there are any other questions that you have um, about the technology, um, then pop those in the chat um, and me and my colleague for Felicity will get back to you um, as soon as we can to sort any of those problems. Um, we can't see any of you um, and you're all on mute, so don't worry about that. Um, but we will get started um, with our webinar this evening. Um, thank you all for, for joining. It's wonderful to have so many of you, you with us. Um, I'm Dr. Kate Petty, I'm the Road Verge Campaign Manager at Plant Life, um, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our um, On the Road to Success um, panel event as part of Plant Life's Fall Into, Na Fall Into Nature series. Um, some of you may have come along to our um, Spring Into Action Road Ridges event back in February, or you may be um, news and that was an introduction to Plant Life's Road Verge campaign and our guidelines, and this time around we thought we'd do things a bit differently and um, we wanted to provide a showcase to the work and experiences of people working directly on road verge projects or um, helping to shape and transform verges for wildlife. Um, um, I'm delighted that we have um, five brilliant panellists with us this evening. Um, we have Ben Hewlett um, who's a senior environmental advisor for National Highways and if you're um, not too familiar with the name National Highways. Um, it's the new name for Highways England. Um, so apologies if we if we get the name wrong tonight, but, but there we are. <laughs> um, um, we have Tim Bird with us. Tim is an ecologist working for, for Cormac Solutions Limited, um, a company owned by Cornwall Council. Um, we have Joel Wally and Liam Blazy, um, respectively the Ecology and Biodiversity Officers for Derbyshire County Council and Janet Cobb, who is a board um, member and volunteer for the really inspiring Restoring Shropshire's Verges project. Um, how this is gonna to work tonight, we're gonna to hear a, a short presentation from, from each of our panelists. And then we're gonna have a, a joint question and answer session with all of us together at the end. Um, so um, please 
write your questions um, in the Q&A function whilst the presentations are going on. Um, and then we'll answer as many as we can um, at the end. Um, the final thing to say is the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be shared on Plant Life's YouTube channel in the next week or so if you want to catch up with it or pass the link on to, to anybody else who, who couldn't be here tonight. So without further ado, um, I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, Ben. Um, ben provides um, environmental guidance um, and advice for National Highway's major projects um, and has recently been involved um, in the implementation of a really exciting new policy to improve biodiversity of, of grasslands created along new major road schemes. So over to you, Ben. Great, thank you very much. I've just requested uh, control tape, so hopefully- I think you should have it. I think I should try that it. and see how, it, sorry, see how it works. See how we get on. <laughs> right, okay. Hello everyone, um, my name is Ben Hewlett and I'm a Senior Environmental Advisor at National Highways, formerly um, Highways England, and um, yeah, just come here to uh, talk about what we're doing um, for grasslands and our uh, verges. So um, first of all, who is National Highways? Um, National Highways are the government-owned organisation that are responsible for the strategic road networks, so that's the really big roads, the um, motorways and major A roads um, in England. So uh, the soft estate, so the parts of the road that aren't tarmac across the country equates to 30,000 hectares, so a huge amount of land that we're um, responsible for. And we're currently in the middle of um, road investment period two, which is um, uh, a £27 billion worth of investment, um, which runs from 2020 to 2025. Um, that investment split between um, about 50 major projects, so big construction projects, uh, maintenance and the designated fund programme for environmental improvements. Um, so just a bit generally about the ecology of road verges and um, our road verges in particular. So as I think everyone on this call be aware that road verge habitat is being increasingly viewed as a, a really important um, source of biodiversity in the UK um, work for, for people such as plant life and academic research media coverage has really um, upped verge profile um, in the country. Um, in their basic form they are linear strips of habitat through um, the landscape um, a lot of the time being the only natural um, habitat within quite urban and intensive landscapes it can be the last refuge for some um, some species. Um, there's also increasing research to say they actually um, have more biodiversity compared to adjacent land. Um, they're relatively undisturbed on um, our big road networks. Not many people um, want to hang out on the side of motorways. Um, there's a real mix of habitats that we have, woodlands, grasslands, heathlands, peatlands, everything you can think of. Um, so really important biodiversity resource. But they can actually be relatively hostile places for fauna, as you might expect. There is um, obviously roadkill, unfortunately, um, but also uh, pollution from the roads, such as heavy metals and turbulence from passing traffic can make um, at least the first um, step into the road verge, so typically the first two metres, which has been identified by University of Exeter Research. Um, it's quite an inhospitable place to be if you're a, an insect or um, other wildlife. Um, and historically, um, they've been poorly managed, so either not cut or cut too much, um, so either scrubbing up or removing next sources entirely um, too early in the season. And I've just included that picture there, as you can see how the, the difference between habitat between the fence line of the road and the surrounding landscape in some places. Um, so typical verge management on um, National Highways roads, again, this varies across the um, Across the country, but we have a two meter swathe cut, which is the first two meters um, of our soft estate twice a year. Um, our grassland plots are typically cut every three to five years, and um, so that's just normal grasslands. Man once we manage for species rich um, habitats, we cut once a year and remove the cuttings, and then we have cyclical woodland management and thinning, all of which are um, subject to high traffic management costs. Um, and verge management in general is, is one of our. Um, 
customers and people that are using the roads, one of their key concerns and a safety concern of ours as well. Right, so to get into what we're trying to do going forward. So my presentation focuses on mainly on constructing new areas of land. Um, so one of the ways we're trying to build roads better is, is build biodiversity into our design. Um, so one way we're doing this is um, in late 2020, we um, launched a low nutrient verge standard um, for our new areas of soft estate that we're making. So new areas of grass and then what we deemed as safety critical areas. Um, so sight lines, uh, vis visibility displays, et cetera. Um, and low nutrient we've defined as the removal of topsoil from the specification of the grasses. So this is a move towards more substrate, um, bare substrate and bare subsoil plots. Um, and this policy is um, going to be applied to um, our major project program. Um, so why would we do this? So I'm sure there are some very informed people on, on the call, but basically vegetation growth is um, dependent on sunlight, water, temperature, and nutrients. And the only thing we can actively really manage during the construction project is nutrients in the soil. Whereas the most nutrients in the soil is the first soil layer, the topsoil. So removal of that soil dense nutrient topsoil can reduce vegetation growth rates dramatically and open up the sward for um, more interesting things to get established. And that mimics our natural um, grass and ecosystems. So we want to move away from the top picture, which is a piece of grass that has been um, what, grown rank, not been cut, fallen on itself, grown out again, crowding out anything else. Um, and one on the bottom left is a much more open uh, subsoil based grass and plot, which is um, that a bee orchid uh, germinate and go to seed there. Um, so the opportunities of removing topsoil is, is uh, they're massive. It, it, it seems bizarre that we um, uh, haven't thought about this sooner, but basically if you reduce vegetation growth, you obviously have less biomass per year to cut. So you have reduces your maintenance burden. You get shorter vegetation because the nutrients in the soil just isn't there to to grow tall plants. Um, and the reduction of maintenance requirement means that we have more resilience within our supply chain to actually get around the network and cut the grass more, and more quickly and more often. Um, and as I said previously, there's an increase in openness within the sward, increasing bare ground, and that actually allows more interesting things to germinate and more diversity of things to germinate. And there's pretty much a guaranteed increase in biodiversity compared to traditional highway seeding. Um, so picture on the right there is, um, people have been on these calls before, they may have heard of the Weymouth Relief Road, um, but that was a scheme that seeded wildflowers directly onto um, bare substrate. And as you can see, there's an amazing array of wildflowers there. I've never seen so many pyramidal orchids in my entire life, um, but that hasn't been cut apart from, well, it hasn't been maintained really, apart from occasional removal of invasive budlia since its construction in, in 2010. So almost, yeah, over 10 years. Removing topsoil also opens other possibilities. So it's one of the main sources of, of weed seeds. So we have to manage our invasive and injurious weeds like any landowner does. And if you remove topsoil, you remove all the problem seeds away. Um, so you save money on weed management. There's also a potential to um, reduce HGV movements during construction. So how it works traditionally is you scrape the topsoil off, you store it somewhere, you pick it then back up again to put it where back once the road has been completely built. So if you're not putting topsoil back or you're moving it just once, there's a saving there. Um, and it's also a really valuable resource. Is it something that we should be putting on road verges to that preserve no benefits and we have to actively cut should they be good for growing trees elsewhere or food. Um, and lack of maintenance or reduction in maintenance and reduction in soil handling can have a potentially huge carbon saving. Um, so ADAS have been working with, um, who are, ADAS are a part of a consultancy called RSK and they're doing work with Dorset County Council at the moment to say these plots actually during maintenance require 97% less carbon to be emitted through maintenance because you just don't have to cut them. You don't have to fire up the mowers. 
so here's uh, again, um, I'll just, I'll just talk about the Weymouth relief road again here because it's the, the crown jewel in um, Verge projects. But um, you can see here quite clearly where the topsoil has been applied and where it hasn't. Um, so if you don't cut the grass for 10 years, usually on traditional circumstances, things scrub up, they go rank, you get um, more scrubby woody, wooded habitat. And if you don't, you have a much more open um, sward. Um, but as with everything, changing the way we do things obviously makes risks and, and considerations that people have to be aware of if they're trying to promote these, uh, these new ways of doing things. Um, so one of the most obvious things to do is, well, we'll think about is where does all the topsoil go? Um, each project that we work on, there's topsoil depths of different, uh, different depths across the country and across different projects. So you might have an excess of topsoil you need to get rid of. You might have a um, not enough topsoil to go around. It's, it will be dependent on the project. Um, so in order to effectively manage those, um, that soil as well, you need enough, light, uh, enough space within your project boundaries to have good soil storage management, all that sort of stuff. Um, geology will also be a key factor in what vegetation can actually grow if you're using this. You can't grow um, acid grass and plants on bare chalk. Um, and there's also runoff from plots and slopes of stability that we also have to be aware of. Um, there's also have to be aware of the ongoing management associated with these plots. So um, although we expect management to be drastically reduced, there is specific management regimes that you'll need to maintain these low nutrient levels in the long term. Um, and we also have to be aware of pioneer woody species that thrive on um, uh, bare substrates. So your, your cotoneasters, your buddleia, and things that can quickly become dominant if not managed. Uh, we also have um, something that I imagine plant life synthesized with quite a lot. We have a public perception issue around what good looks like. A lot of people still want bowling green sort of verges. Um, and if we're changing the way we're doing things and moving towards a more low nutrient environment, there's going to be more bare ground, vegetation is going to establish lower, and there's going to be a fundamental um, change in how a verge looks. And the verge is going to change in the long term. So we need to manage public perception in that. We also need to be aware of carbon sequestration rates. There's going forward, we're going to have to get as much carbon sequestration out of our estates as possible. Um, but less organic matter in the soil might mean less sequestration in the soil. But extensive root system of wildflowers might negate that. So there's lots of um, uh, considerations. And also, we have something a problem with our contractors. Well, not a problem, but a challenge with our contractors about what is deemed a success in these. So, how can, because it's an unpredictable process. Um, how do you know when it's finished and the contractor can walk away? Um, but ultimately, the ways to establish these vegetation on these plots are much the same as you would establish a um, wildflower meadow in other places. Natural colonization, if you've got the time and you're okay with bare ground, you can use green hay from um, local areas, local other species rich grasslands, uh, locally sourced seed, commercial seed mixes. Um, but this is not an unusual way to make these grasslands. We're just building this now into our um, uh, design standards going forward. Um, but really important thing about bare ground and getting rid of the nutrients is we have to make sure that our seed mixes can grow on this and include pioneer species. So um, kidney vetches, buzz truffle, uh, oxide daisies, things that like to grow in bare ground. Um, we need to include in our seed mixes, otherwise it's going to look very bad. Um, so one thing I was very conscious about uh, around uh, this uh, presentation was what are we doing on our existing verges? We talked about new verges that we're making, but what are we doing on that 30,000 hectares that we already own? Um, so currently we're doing um, trials to look at uh, changing management to a cut and collect program. And um, so instead of traditionally cutting the vegetation and leaving it, we're cutting it and taking it away. Um, so we've got money to do a three-year trial um, on the A11 in Thetford Forest, on the Thetford Forest, and we're measuring how the um, soil nutrients react to um, and biodiversity reacts annually uh, as, a, as a result of each treatment. And we're exploring the impacts and practicalities of a rising disposal, because one of the main problems with doing that is what you do with the arising. So as you can see, we've, we've bailed them and um, are exploring different ways of managing them.
Um, so next steps for us, oh, I've gone too far, is, uh, yeah, we're going to continue to implement this policy around low nutrient grassland creation. And we have to support our internal project managers um, and provide an education service around sort of promoting this method. Uh, we're working on internal and external guidance to help people that want to replicate these sites elsewhere to do so. Um, communication and collaboration with them anyone who's interested, pretty much. Um, advocacy with local councils, developers, uh, verge management trials, as I've said, um, and we're looking to explore the wider benefits of that approach as well. Um, so I realise there's a lot of information in that, but um, hopefully I've kept the time. <laughs> and um, yeah, back to you, Kate. Brilliant, um, thank you. It's fascinating to hear about all about the new policies. Um, and, uh, we look forward to, to watching the results um, over the next couple of years. Um, our next speaker is Tim Bird um, from uh, Cormac Solutions Limited and Tim provides advice um, and consultancy on environment, environmental matters down at, at Cormac and the Council and he's going to give us a, a Cornish perspective um, on um, wildflower verge management. Thank you Tim, over to you. Hi, uh, yeah thanks for that Ben and thanks for invited me here this evening. Um, I'm just trying to go back actually. Um, hmm, that <laughs> I'll have to go all the way to the end and start again. Oh no, sorry guys. I'll... That's all right, I'll go back for you Tim. There we Thank go. Thank you. Don't worry. There's your first one. Go for Brilliant. it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, Kate. Rescued. Thank you for that. Um, so my name's Tim. I'm an ecologist with Cormac Solutions Limited. What I'd like to do following Ben's uh, presentation is to kind of go through verge maintenance uh, from a Cornish perspective, really. So what I'd like to go through today is um, obviously introductions, look at what happened post-2019 practice, um, what happened from sort of 2019 onwards, and looking at a time for change and how we monitor our current progress. <laughs> I think my pretty oh, here we go. It's a bit slow, sorry, Tim. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, a bit like me, actually. So there you go. So post-2019 practices, I mean, basically, it was a moat mo and be damned sort of process, really, where you'd hear things from uh, from highway colleagues saying, well, we've always done it that way. We've always undertaken mowing this time of year. We've always wanted to go for a bowling green effect. And um, we'd be cutting between April and August. You know, monthly mowing, sometimes we'd have seven plus cuts a year. So really mowing to the extreme. And that didn't really do us any good when it comes to complaints from members of the public, where we were mowing uh, bee orchids and other orchids. I know there are areas where we had lesser, uh, lesser butterfly orchids and they're no, they were no longer there just through overcutting. Also bad, bad press through multimedia, social media, Facebook and Twitter. You know, we were getting a lot of bad press press through Cormac Council and, and Cormac, who are kind of the, 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 the uh, network deliverers, the service deliverers. Um, so, you know, it wasn't looking good. It really wasn't. And there were even officers within Cormac Council and Cormac were saying, why are we cutting like this? Um, Cormac Council also introduced policies in, as a result of the climate and ecological crisis. So as an example, we had a pollinator strategy that said, you know, we need to increase our pollinators. We need to, we need to reduce our reliance on herbicides and pesticides. Um, and also we had projects such as the green infrastructure for growth. So a really fantastic project where we're looking at our green areas. How can we start to rewild? How can we start to improve our biodiversity where we, some areas we had none. And as Ben was saying, the road network, the highway ver verge network throughout Cornwall, throughout uh, the UK is a fantastic asset if it's managed correctly. So there was various meetings um, between 2019 and 2020, even pre 2019 there was various meetings there was a working group set up between officers within Cornwall Council and um, technical staff within Cormac who were sort of saying well how can we change this how can we make things better
So basically, we agreed of a time. It was a time to change. So we decided there would be no mowing during the growing season, especially in the urban areas where previously um, people were looking at a, a, a bowling green effect. Um, however, we would still agree that there was a safety cut required around road junctions to ensure that visibility is maintained. We were also looking at machinery where we could have a cut and collect, especially within the ver urban verge areas where, again, an amazing asset. Um, part of the green infrastructure project was looking at our urban areas. How can we uh, improve biodiversity? So we'd also select verges, we'd strip the soil off, we'd lay um, wildflower turf, we'd overseed with wildflower seed. So we're really looking to improve our, our green areas, including the highway verge areas. Um, so again, we were looking at machinery, we were looking at cut, cut and collect, uh, especially in our uh, urban verge areas to um, start to reduce soil fertility, the nutrient levels. Again, we weren't looking to strip every single highway verge area of its soil. This is a slow reduction over a number of years to improve our best practice. And as a, as a, as a result, we had Reduce, reduction in complaints so we weren't cutting the orchids during sort of June time you know we were we were making sure that the uh, the orchids were that were left until a time when we could cut we also looked at meeting our performance indicators our key performance indicators set by uh, set by the the local authority Cornwall Council and we actually saw an improvement in bars at biodiversity and the ecological services as well and in a minute, I'll go into a bit more details of how we actually monitored, monitor, monitored that. So through the working group, we agreed that it was a change of practice. Also, we looked at mapping our highway verge areas. Where are the areas that we don't want to cut? Where are the important areas? We also have an inventory of, uh, of, uh, of nationally and, in, and locally important species. That inventory was from 1996. Now, the monitoring that I've done of that inventory, a lot of the plants are no longer there. I'm hoping they're dormant, I'm hoping that they've just been overcut and they are actually there ready to, uh, ready to, ready to propagate. And if there's any seed, you know, the, the conditions are right for, for seed germination. But there was also some areas where I was actually, um, we were scarifying, we're cutting collect, we're scarifying the area and we were setting, we were sowing um, plants like yellow rattle, which are peri, semi-parasitic against grass. So the argument is we can have yellow rattle um, sown you know, does that then create a condition where the grass is reduced in its in its vigor in its height? Again, a lot of the lot of the uh, the verge areas were very very tussocky type grasses, um, which were not ideal for uh, for for wildflowers. So basically what I was tasked to do um, once the new regime was put into place is, is monitoring. It's all very well saying we we're going to change our practices. How do you then gauge the impact? How do you then gauge the, the effectiveness of this, uh, of this new regime? And it isn't just about saving money. A lot of the members of the public I met were saying, well, what are you doing is trying to save money. That wasn't the case. There were other things going on in the background. So I was tasked with undertaking monitoring surveys, botanical surveys in two towns, in Redruth, which is to the west of the county, and in Liscard, which is to the east. So two different areas, two different uh, locations, two different towns. Um, so I would then look at the number of species present. So basically we had 10 verges in each town. Each verge would have seven one meter quadrats. So I would then lay the quadrats in a, in a specific area. I'd then count the number of flowering species. And also we'd look at any undesirable species, your invasive non-native species, uh, such as Mombrecia, uh, such as winter heliotrope. Winter heliotrope in Cornwall is a big issue. And over the over the coming few years, we'd like to really get on top of those areas. We've got areas of winter heliotrope where we've also got uh, bee orchids. Now, bee orchids are, are quite rare to Cornwall. Uh, they were introduced accidentally, um, but they're a fantastic plant and or fantastic orchid and they're being outcompeted by the invasive non-native species so we're looking at management how can we reduce the non-natives and improve the natives so with each quadrat i'd actually undertake the number of species do a count within that one meter quadrat i'd then look at potential cover of the higher plants of the flowering plants per quadrat was it 80 percent was it 10 percent 
um, look at the number of flora, flora units of insect pollinating plant species. So looking at the pollinators within that quadrat with their honeybees, with their hoverflies, with their sawflies, with their um, butterflies, etc. And then look at percentage cover of wildflower and sedges within that quadrat. And again, mainly above ground vegetation height. So I would actually measure the height of those uh, of those wildflowers. So that was the criteria for monitoring our our impact. So I did a survey in 2020, and that was my baseline data. And I've just completed a survey in 2021. So we can now start to compare effectiveness. OK, we're only two years in, but um, what I'd like to do is, is show you some, uh, hopefully, some interesting facts of, of what I found. So this is Liscard. Um, I've just taken the first five quadrats. So within Liscard, there was 10 verges. Um, sorry, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've, I'm looking at five verges and each verge would have seven quadrats. So if we take verge one as an example, in 2020, there was 13% average percentage cover of wildflowers. When we started to cut and collect, that has increased to 30%. Um, the number of flowering units has also increased. Okay, you can't, the problem is pollinators, as you know, they're pretty transient, they move around quite a lot. So uh, you can't, if, you know, if I moved moved quadrat, there could be that next minute you'd get a, you get a, a honeybee present. So again, within quadrat one or verge one, within the quadrats, we saw an increase in flowering units and the average percentage of cover uh, across that verge. Um, if you look at, again, looking at Verge 2 in 2020, which is our baseline data, uh, I recorded 10 flowering units, okay, a 22% cover with one pollinating species. This year, there was an increase of one. But interestingly, we actually had an increase in overall percentage of cover per quadrat from 22% to 31%. So already we're seeing an improvement in our practices. We're seeing an improvement in biodiversity within those, those verges. Um, again, I'm not quite sure what, what went wrong with quad, sorry, verge number four, but we have seen a reduction there, 54 compared to 50% 50% this year so in 2020 we had our baseline data so we're starting to monitor moving down to verge 5 2020 we saw 26% cover uh, within the quadrat and then that increased 31% so I find this quite interesting because you can actually see immediately there's improvements as soon as you change your cutting regime as soon as you look at cut and collect um, if you then look to scarif scarification, overseeding, you're going to see an improvement. So it, to me, it's a no-brainer. We need to continue this. So next steps for me is to then to produce a report to our senior officers, senior managers to say the initial results are positive and that uh, we should continue. So that's it for me. That is a blindingly quick presentation. I've zoomed through, so hopefully you found that of interest. But thank you for thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Tim. It's wonderful to hear and fantastic to see that the wildflowers are, are bouncing back um, so quickly already. Um, that's wonderful. Right. Next up, um, we have um, the wildflower project from Denbyshire County Council. We have both Liam and Joel here this evening, um, and they'll be here for our live Q and A later. But to save any mishaps um, with inter internet connections in the wilds, wilds of North Wales. Um, they've kindly um, recorded um, a video presentation for us already. So hopefully, um, if all the technology works, this is going to play and you'll all be able to hear it. So let's fingers crossed and see. Hi, my name's Liam. I'm the Biodiversity Officer for Denbyshire County Council. And today I'd like to talk to you about our wildflower project. So the project's goals really are to develop a network of local provenance seed banks across the county. Uh, we want to link these in with our bee friendly sites, our biodiversity verge pilot sites and the council's wider rural road verge network. We want to do this, um, you know, in partnership with town councils, community councils, community groups, schools, conservation organizations, really anybody who's interested in expanding uh, wildflower habitat. The goal is to eventually um, go beyond our borders into neighbouring councils and eventually across North Wales and have large connecting habitat um, right across the north of the country. So that's our goal um, and we're pushing hard to achieve it. 
So how the project began, um, Council has 11 roadside nature reserves. Uh, they've been designated for their rare plant assemblages. They make up, up about 10.7 acres. Uh, they're scattered across the county. They have a variety of different species on them. Um, the one on the lower left actually has Bivinian vetch on it, which um, was fortunately saved from extinction in the county by my colleague Joel, who gathered some seed pods uh, before it got flailed. Um, <clears throat> now, alongside our roadside nature reserves, the council um, set about set, well, set about creating a new rural road verge policy. Um, that was done in collaboration with a local group called Life on the Verge. Um, this policy focuses on roads outside of the 30 to 40 mile an hour limit and on principal roads. Um, these verges are cut once a year from August onwards and it covers roughly 78% of the county, um, which makes up about 1,800 kilometers. Or if you like me and you think that roads should have two verges, uh, let's say 3,600 kilometers because it sounds better. Um, so there's a quick picture of how the network covers the county. Um, it does unfortunately show the um, sections of road that aren't included, but it was the only map I could find. Um, originally, we set out to um, start surveying our street scene sites after some of our colleagues were mowing this site here, plus Lorna, and started to notice some wildflowers on it. We wrote up a management plan, and three years later, it looks like this. It's uh, an incredible site, 87 different species recorded on it. Uh, to start with the street scene surveys, um, we developed a rapid grassland assessment survey using ArcGIS uh, Survey123 Connect. It allowed us to get out to 93 sites, uh, survey all of them in three days. Uh, it gave us the opportunity to gather a large amount of data rapidly, uh, and we were able to assess the site's um, most diverse uh, for putting forward to our biodiversity verge pilot. Uh, during that time, we gathered about 950 um, wildflower records. You know, these sites were mowed, so it was a bit more tricky to tell what was there, but um, the rapid grassland assessment was invaluable during that time. From the street scene surveys, um, the council declared a climate and ecological emergency. We then put forward the 93 sites that we surveyed. Um, they were cut down and um, we've ended up with 58 sites now included within the Biodiversity Verge pilot. These sites are managed by Street Scene. Each sign has a bee friendly sign on it, as you can see on the left, and a wildflower meadow creation sign on the right. Uh, they undergo monthly assessments. We wrote up another survey, um, a grassland monitoring survey using Survey123. Um, we've done 268 surveys so far, and we've gathered 4,370 wildflower records. Um, and out of those notable species in Denbyshire, we've got 44 scarce species, seven scarce to rare species, and nine rare species. So these sites are, are producing um, valuable data, and it's starting to show that through correct management, uh, we can start developing quality wildflower habitat. Um, now you need to do cut and collect, as we all know. Um, we were very fortunate to get funding from Welsh Government's local nature partnership, um, local places for nature, and this allowed us to buy specialized cut and collect machinery. So we've got two sets of Trackmaster BS, BCS 740s. They have a scythe, a rake, a harrow, and mini balers. Uh, one set for the north, one for the south. Uh, we also got the Rydon Azeki SF450s, which cut and collect. And this is what our street scene colleagues use to manage our sites. Uh, back in 2018, the council was awarded bee friendly status by the Welsh Government. Uh, this allows us to designate sites as bee friendly sites as long as they fall within the management criteria. Um, we launched a logo competition um, back in 2019. Uh, we had 13 schools enter and 531 entrants, and this was the winning logo. And this goes on all of our signage 
for both the Bee Friendly Project and the Biodiversity Verge Pilot, and it's the logo for the overall Wildflower Project. Now, we gather seeds from our roadside nature reserves and our Biodiversity Verge Pilot sites annually. Um, we take these seeds down to the Botvari Woodland Skill Center where they are grown on, and so far we've had 7,000 wildflower plugs grown by the, by the skill center, and we use these to go out and create uh, community bee friendly sites at schools um, and with community councils on, on the sites that they manage. Um, as I said earlier, we can designate these sites as bee friendly sites. So the, the seed collection has been exceptionally valuable. We've also used some of these uh, plug plants to boost the species diversity on our biodiversity verge sites. You know, sometimes they need a little bit of extra help. Now, we have been sharing our grassland surveying templates with our neighbors. So Flincher has a copy of it and Conway have a copy. Flinch has been quite active. Conway has as well. Unfortunately, uh, their data is, hasn't been shared yet. Um, but collaborative GIS data um, sharing provides a clearer picture of the current state of our grassland habitats across the northeast of Wales. Um, we can now share our data seamlessly with Covnod. Um, it's absorbed into the ORS. Um, we send them the data form at the end of the year and within a day it's, it's online. And that is now shared with the NBN Atlas as well. So our future plans, um, we want to further link our biodiversity verge pilot sites with our rural road verge network. Uh, we want to create large connective wildflower habitats across the county. We want to expand this into our neighboring um, counties as well and have regional connecting wildflower habitat. Uh, we want to expand on the number of um, counties and organizations that are using our grassland surveying template. Unified data is so important. Um, you know, when it comes to just data sharing, it, it makes sense if we're all using the same template. Um, it's free if anybody wants it, just give me a shout and I'll send it straight over. Uh, we've currently identified 435 sites as having potential for biodiversity enhancements. So we've got a lot of ground truthing to do. And um, yeah, once we, once we get through those, um, I'm sure there will be quite a bit more to talk about. So some of the project numbers, I won't go through all of them. Uh, we've currently got 69 bee-friendly wildflower meadows, and that includes our uh, roadside nature reserves. We've gathered 4,377 uh, species records uh, from 263 surveys. Um, we've recorded 268 different species on these sites. Um, we've shared our template with Conwy, Flincher, the North Wales Wildlife Trust out on Anglesey, uh, Merthyr Tidville in the south, and weirdly, uh, South Gloucestershire in England as well. Um, the total acreage of our urban meadows is roughly 40 acres. And as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've grown on 7,000 plug plants and our road verge network is 1,800 or 3,600 kilometers. So that's just a, a quick roundup of some of the numbers. And what are we doing for the future? We've secured funding for a tree nursery, which is almost completed now. Um, it's going to focus on locally prov provenant and rare trees and wildflowers. Oh, excuse me for the technical hitch. Um, we've lost the end of Liam's presentation. Don't know quite what has happened there. Um, let me see if I can uh, play that from where we were. Hi, my name's Liam. I'm... Thank you for listening. Ooh, I, feel I like missed a bit. The numbers Just about there. The we'll go from there. <laughs> some of the older sites uh, faster, and we can start sowing uh, seed on our rural road verge network where it's become rank over the years. Um, so it, it's about getting wildflower habitat that's locally provenant to Denbyshire on a mass scale. Okay, thank you for listening. I feel like I ran through that. So I'll end with just a quick video of the three foot wide, uh, three foot wide verge that um, it's about three years old now. 
Uh, it's a really nice little site. I don't think many people notice it when they drive past. Um, but I love it. Even though on multiple occasions now I can both. Fortunately, I'm always in high vis. Okay, so on that note, uh, I'd just like to thank everybody who's been involved with the project over the years. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank Plant Life. If it wasn't for their Verge guidance documents, um, our project wouldn't have developed as fast um, and we wouldn't have had the data to back up our findings. So um, thank you to Plant Life and thank you to everyone who's helped us over the years. There we go. Thank you so much, Ian and Joel. It's such um, a well-rounded project and there's so much in it. Um, it's really, uh, really inspiring to see. Um, and from councils onto communities and our final speaker, um, Janet Cobb um, from Restoring Shropshire's Verges Project. And Janet's really been insp instrumental in inspiring and um, helping to carry out the transformation of Verges across South Shropshire. So over to you, Janet. Okay, thank you for inviting me, Kate. And um, well, it's quite daunting to follow those three presentations, <laughs> so I'll try my best. So I have started off with a little film, which I hope is going to play. Verges can be fantastic places for wildflowers, filled with colour and sound as an array of flowers supply pollen and nectar to insects throughout the spring and summer. Our verges are in trouble though. Years of poor management has led to a decline in wildflowers as they are replaced by larger, more vigorous plants. We have a project in Shropshire which aims to reverse this loss, restoring verges to their previous beauty and making them more valuable for wildlife. My name's Rob Rowe, I'm part of RSVP, which is Restoring Shropshire's Verges Project. Um, this is the second year that's been running, and we're on a main road near Bishop's Castle at the moment, where last year it was the grass was cut and removed late in the season, and then yellow rattle was spread, and, and this year it's done very well. Yellow rattle is a wildflower that is really useful in helping create a flowery verge. It is rightly called the meadow maker. Yellow rattle can draw nutrition from surrounding grasses via the roots, weakening the grass and helping flowers to thrive. So this, is, this is actually quite a, a, a good bit of verge here. This is bird's foot trefoil over there and bush vetch and tufted vetch. And then in the background over there, we've got some uh, knapweed coming up. Over the last 60 years, we have lost almost all of our wildflower meadows, including flowers on the verges. Verges are potentially long, thin meadows, which also provide a corridor for wildlife to move through the landscape. So th th this is a really good verge here because you've got a, a really great kind of assemblage of plants. There's, there's lots of different flowering plants, there's lots of different grasses, fine grasses. And with all that, those different plants, then you get, you get lots of different insects. And then as you go back into the back of the verge and into the hedge, then there's kind of a bit rougher plants as well, which, which give, give uh, shelter to, to other things. By cutting verges at the right time of year for the flowers and fine grasses, and by collecting up the grass cuttings to remove for composting, we can restore wildflowers to the verge. This is a bit of road verge which hasn't been managed or we could maybe say it's been badly managed. Uh, in the foreground here we've got lots of nettles which are taking over and the false oat grass, this very tall tough grass here and back here we've got lots of coxfoot grass and then further in the background we've got, we've got the hogweed coming in. When a verge is cut at the wrong time of year and the cuttings are not collected and removed most of the wildflowers and fine grass species are lost and coarser, more common species will take over. Although these commoner species can be good for wildlife too, we have lost our special meadow flowers. 
Restoring Shropshire's Verges project has been set up by local people, the National Trust, Plant Life and Caring for God's Acre. We are surveying verges for meadow plants and then working with Shropshire Council to manage them well. Where species have been lost from verges, we are putting them back, taking seeds from local churchyards, meadows and from other verges. Please help us and support us to make our verges beautiful again. Should we go back a slide? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> no, we need to go back a bit further, I think. So our project started properly in 2017 with two pilot sites, uh, villages Edgerton and Norbury. And as we said on the video, it's now a proper partnership built on an alliance of um, organisations across Shropshire. It was established from the bottom up which is different from the other three presentations, I think. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we, we're dependent on lots and lots of volunteers to uh, carry this forward. So a number of organisations came together, uh, Caring for God's Sake, the National Trust, the Stepping Stones Project, which is a project in uh, Shropshire, Shropshire Hills, AOMB, which is about connecting and creating habitats between two major sites. And... Uh, We've all been very grateful to Plant Life to give us guidance, and I don't think we would have got anywhere without the, the proper uh, guidance from Plant Life. The Alliance was formed in 2018 and is run entirely by volunteers. Uh, right from the beginning of the project, we decided that we wanted to work in partnership with um, the Council Highways Department, and this summer is the first summer we've been able to engage with Highways England, which are now called National Highways, I've just learned, <laughs> uh, to explore the possibility of working in partnership to restore some of the major road verges through the county um, and helping with the key performance indicators on biodiversity. And I would encourage everybody to look at the official documents and use those documents as for some of the levers to talk to councillors and politicians and highways departments. Uh, very important to us, we engaged right at the beginning with the politicians in Shropshire. So, and again, I would encourage everybody wanting to start a project to find out who the portfolio holder is for highways in your uh, district and uh, talk to them about uh, bird restoration. Uh, the first success we got with our um, highways department was to agree a late cut in either late July or the beginning of August. And we agreed that directly with South Shropshire Highways Department. Um, the very first presentation we did, we invited the, the Shropshire Highways manager along to that presentation. So he was involved right from the very beginning. So in Edgerton, which is the village that I live in, we established a Verge volunteer group and we received a small grant, a Shropshire Hills AOMB grant. And we used some of that grant money to pay for Edgerton Verges to be surveyed by a, a qualified botanist. We had no idea what we'd got before we did the survey. So we, right at the beginning, decided to establish data. And we discovered that um, we've got 53 species of interest and we also collected a photographic record of what we've got. We also bought some size. We are very little village with lots of country lanes and no pavements and um, having size meant if there was a problem, we could just go out and cut it. We didn't have to wait three weeks for the council to come and cut it. Um, we bought yellow rattle seed, we bought plant plugs and wildflower seed and we decided that we would um, start with the village hall verge. Um, the reason we decided to do this was it was a, a, not a very good verge at all, as you can see from the picture on the left. And uh, it was a show verge for the village. So we wanted to prove that we could make a difference uh, on at least one verge. Um, so the picture on the left is before we cleared it and the picture on the right is after we cleared the, uh, the vegetation. It's not, oh, oh, sorry. Right. Gone back. Can you go back one? 
So these, this is a difference one year made on that particular verge. So we intentionally planted into it. And in, in just one year, we made some sort, sort of impact. Um, oh, sorry. And in 2019 to 2021, we applied for a National Lottery Heritage Grant um, with the aim to capture data from a much wider area and to try and make the financial and biodiversity case, uh, case for change in Shropshire and try and embed some good practice into Shropshire's highways contract. And we wanted to explore the opportunity for bioenergy production. I don't know whether anybody else has done that yet. I'd be quite interested to know whether that's happened anywhere. We uh, trolls up to 20 kilometres of wide red, uh, main road verges as pilot size to try and make the cost benefit analysis. And we've got a, a conference planned on Saturday the 13th of November. If anybody's in the vicinity, you'd be very welcome to come. So between 2018 and now, it's the project sort of organically developed into two distinct initiatives. The first initiative is trial sites of between 10 and 20 kilometres on wide verges, which you saw in the film, which are predominantly around Bishop's Castle in South Shropshire. And these verges have been intentionally planted with yellow rattle and now they're naturally regenerating with wildflowers, plus some intentional planting back of wildflower species. And then we've got a second bit of the project and we've got a series of 36 mini RSVP projects across Shropshire totally managed by local volunteer groups with outreach from the main project, giving support to volunteer groups. And we've actually got more than 36 projects now because it's growing, it's like um, topsy across Shropshire. Uh, two local schools have also indicated interest in initiate, initiating a restorative project on school grounds. And again, I'd be very interested to know whether anybody else has made that sort of a a breakthrough with schools and young people. Um, we might well adopt that as one of the key performance indicators for RSVP in the future. So these are the results on the wide main road verges. Uh, and again, this is just uh, one year's difference. So, so we um, cut, collected, scarified, sold yellow rattle and there you are, it's like magic, it just appears. Um, and these, are, and now I'm gonna show you a, a few of the mini verge restoration projects. So this verge is actually in front of my house. <laughs> so in, when uh, we had COVID, we decided that we were going to lay the hedge and we exposed a new verge. So this was like a, a trial really. We um, put some signs in and we did some intentional planting and allowed just natural establishment of verge vegeta vegetation. And that's the result. That's just one year's result. If you let nature come back and do some intentional planting, it's absolutely amazing. And this is the same verge, loads of plants. It's a 101 meters long verge. So we wanted to prove that it could be done and I'm not a botanist or a gardener or, or anything special. So what I would say, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> um, we also have got a, a, a mini meadow group, uh, or, or a Ludlow based um, uh, verge project where a small group, mostly women, got together and decided to restore a very ordinary verge. So this is a, this picture on the left is just a verge that you see on millions of housing estates anywhere. Um, we, they leafleted um, local residents for support and uh, the portfolio holder at the time was informed. We didn't ask permission for this. We just decided that we were going to do it. But we chose the ver a verge, which was an ordinary verge with a pavement and not on a very busy road. Um, and there they are intentionally planting. And this is what happened. So again, this is one year's uh, input. So intentional planting in the top left. Uh, in spring we can see flowers starting to appear and in summer it, it was a full-blown mini meadow all just waiting to be to, to grow by itself. 
uh, it was managed. There were signs put in the verge that spin-offs, two spin-offs, is we got no litter and we got no uh, dog poo in it. So that was like two pluses that were unintentional uh, consequences for that. In the uh, late uh, summer, it was scythed. It, those, the horizons were all raked off and, to, and taken away by volunteers. So it didn't cost anything either. And this is uh, a, a, another project from Nestcliff where one resident wanted to ensure a new verge on the edge of a new housing estate retained its wildflowers rather than being grassed over and presented as a, a lawn. So he took it under his wing. And again, this is just one year's work. And you can see just how, mu how many wildflowers were in that um, verge. This is, I, I didn't, he didn't manage to take a photograph when it was full blown. This is, um, he started cutting it and I persuaded him to take a photograph quickly and send it to me. Okay, so our conference is on the 13th of November in Norbury. And as I said, everybody's invited. Um, uh, I can send this, well, Kate's gonna send the slides out, I think. Um, I'm just probably okay. got a slide to come up. Can you move it on, Kate? I will try. There we go. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so if anybody's interested in talking to us, there's the email addresses to get in touch. And I'd be very happy to help anybody um, set up a, a, a similar verge project. The more, the merrier. OK. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet. It's really inspiring to hear all that you've been doing. And I know a lot of our supporters and, and volunteer groups and individuals around the country will be similarly inspired. and with lots of information for, for them to take home as well. Um, we're gonna move on to our Q&A um, as quickly as we can. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment, if I can, so we can all see each other. Um, now we've had lots of questions come in and because Janet is in such high demand, I know she needs to go soon as well. Um, but um, before, before she goes, I thought maybe one nice question that had come in and it's around perceptions of of verges and somebody's written they said I get a lot of complaints from residents as a chair of a community association um, how do we make wild verges beautiful and not messy and I wondered in your experience Janet with all of the public communications and engagement you've done how that you found to to change people's mindsets about verges No, I've unmuted myself. No, there you are. Um, yeah, uh, um, I guess what, I, what I've spent a lot of time going around doing presentations to people and starting getting uh, new groups up and running. And my experience is, is when you show people the pictures of what's possible, it's the pictures that change people's minds. And once people see what is possible, then most people come on board. I've come across very, very little resistance after a talk and uh, it, it's usually tidiness and road safety are the two issues that come up and it, it's really an, a re-education um, program that we need to undertake but I think we're turning the Titanic with millions of little tugs and uh, mm -hmm. my sense is that public opinion is changing and the more publicity we can get and the more people who keep saying the same thing over and over the, the better we're almost creating a tidal wave of change, I feel. I'm very optimistic about the, the whole project. Brilliant, thank you, and it's wonderful. And it was fantastic to hear how your signage as well helped, helped to convey to local people what was happening. And I think other councils have found that as well, get the signage right and the communications, and that can really help with the success of a project. Yeah, we, um, we, had, we had lots of people stopping, slowing down cars in front of our house reading the signs before driving on so it works oh. brilliant no, it's wonderful um we have lots of questions it's going to be tricky to to pick from all of them i think um one question that had come through for for you ben around um i almost said uh the wrong name uh, national highways's work um is the low nutrient policy for new developments only or would it also be suitable for on do you plan to convert existing verges as well with this approach 
Yes, yeah, so the policy at the moment is is new constructions because that's where it's easiest to do. So um, when you're already playing around with soil, it's much easier to to get the right conditions for wildflowers than than convert it like everyone else on the call is doing. It, it takes time. Um, but as I said in my presentation, we're looking at various different ways of enhancing our existing verges through um, um, one of the main uh, one of our main ways of getting information for that is this trial on the A11. So we're in our second year of that at the moment. And we basically just have to figure out the practicalities of how to do it on a, on a major motorway. Um, it's not going to be possible everywhere just for safety concerns, but we need to make sure that, um, yeah, that we're managing it for biodiversity and we want to do the best we can. But it's just figuring out what's practical. Definitely. And there's, um, if anybody wants some more guidance on creating new road verges from scratch, um, there's some more information in Plant Life's Managing Grass and Road Verges on that as well. And there's a great link on the Highways of England website to all of their new plans there um, as well. Um, a question in maybe for, for Tim and, and our ecologists on the call as well. Um, somebody's asked a question around cut and collect and whether that would be suitable um, on, a, on a local wildlife site or a, or a protected road verge as well. I think it's imperative really cut and collect. I mean, if you don't, if you cut and just drop, you know, you, you, you're creating thatch within the grass sward. Um, a, lot of, a lot of flowers, when they seed, the seed needs a bare soil to germinate. So you, you're not really creating the conditions right that would enable seed germination. So by removing the horizons, you're hopefully over time, as Ben was saying, reducing uh, soil nutrients, and then again, allowing that seed to come in contact with bare ground, which then would require or provide conditions right for seed germination. So, it, it, you know, I've done a lot of wildflower meadow management throughout my career, and uh, I think it's imperative, really. Brilliant. Thank you. And in terms, this is sort of a another question for the ecologist, in terms of managing perhaps neglected verges, somebody's asked, what to do about brambles on a on a slightly neglected verge if you want to restore it? Do you leave them be or, or cut them down? Is brambles a bad thing? <laughs> great for uh, great for, you know for butterflies. Um, so yeah, I mean if it, the idea is to cutting you know when it comes to brambles is keep cutting them back, you know. But you know brambles are a good a good part of our, our biodiversity, yeah. so it is important that um, you know it can you could argue that they're in, an important aspect of our natural environment so it's they're, they're not all bad but understand you know you want you want to maintain a balance exactly. so you know so yeah if that helps wonderful um we've had lots of questions in for for john and liam um you mentioned um that you received funding for your project um if another council is is looking for funding but you know has constraints in terms of budget cuts um where might be a good place to look for, for grants or, or how did you approach it from that point of view? Yeah, so we were really lucky actually that Welsh Government have kind of put this as one of their priorities. So we're part of an enabling natural resources and wellbeing uh, project with the other local nature partnerships across, across Wales, which has basically meant that every local authority involved in that has got a pot of money for local places for nature, which is basically about creating um, biodiversity benefits and, and spaces in and around where people live and work. So we were very fortunate um, this time we were in the Brilliant. And um, another one for for you with your, your with your council hats on. If if somebody wants to to do something with the verge outside their house, um, or even a plot of land that doesn't belong to them, but they want to bring the wildflowers back, how would you suggest the best ways for for them to go about contacting the council or? Or how much would a, a council want to help them get involved or top tips for them in that situation? I think just send an email um, through the kind of customer services or whatever. I'd, I'd really encourage people to be supportive of this because, you know, it's it's easy in this setting now to kind of forget that there are people that don't like this and that, that don't want the change. Um, you know, and I think if your local authorities are already doing stuff and, and kind of started to make those sort of small, small steps forward, support them and, and kind of put your voice to that because that's the stuff that's really, really useful um, going forward. You know, um, it's been it's been really difficult for us, I think. Um, 
you know people sometimes forget we're we're kind of in the middle you know we we, we get kind of things where we're not doing enough um in some people's eyes and doing you know way too much in others so um you know i'd say i'd say be really supportive and just just get in touch with people through through the calls you know even contact your local councillor as well you know because that can be a really good foot in the in, into into getting this stuff sorted excellent as well and i think it's if you like janet has, has shown us as well if you have a group of people locally that are behind it and you can tell that to your council as well then that's another incentive for them um, to get on board and help support you as well. Um, one question and perhaps one of the last ones to, to touch on, um, somebody's written in to say, um, Liverpool has a lot of grass verges. Um, what's the potential for, for this type of urban verge um, to become a, a wildlife friendly site? I know from a few different examples, we've heard some things going on in urban areas, whether that, that seems like cut and collect, is key in, in urban areas um, for for making verges that that look neat but also wildlife friendly as well. Yeah, I think the principles are the same, aren't they? Through through all of these things, it's just reducing the nutrients and you know letting things uh, last long enough between the cuts for things to flower and seed. You know, so I think we the practices that we're putting in across all of this stuff, I think that, that that's a common theme going through everything that we've heard today, even though we're approaching, you know, different projects and doing different things, we're all trying to achieve that same stuff. And there's, there's no reason that urban verges and urban grassland spaces can't, can't be really good for biodiversity to use in those principles. Cause you know, we're getting really good results on our site. Some of them are right in the middle of housing estates and we're getting orchids pop it up in the first year of uh, stopping this. So, you know, yeah. definitely, definitely possible. I think also, also be brave. You know, don't worry about making mistakes. You know, I've done a lot of trials with yellow rattle. I think it's a wonderful plant. Um, we've had successes. We've had failures. You know, I was um, managing an area where I'd uh, spent two years sowing yellow rattle and getting the ground right and then had a team go in and mow the lot. You know, so so after a bit of a paddy and jumping up and down, stamping my feet, you know, we, we managed to turn things around. So be brave, be be loud. You know, and social media is a great tool. It really is. And I think Cornwall it certainly helped us to get our ducks in a row and, and move in the right direction. Just Excellent. to add on that, if you um if you see people doing road improvements and, and moving large quantities of substrate around, um just make them aware of the opportunity, I guess. Um, because if they could do well, if you can design in the biodiversity from the first um point, uh, you're going to get a lot quicker results and those results are going to maintain in the long term so um yeah just keep an eye on on people moving soil around i think <laughs> we have one um excellent question um on the technology or the equipment that has come in uh, this one's for for liam and joel uh why did you go for the ezeki mowers rather than um the amazonis or or any other like the grillo mowers why did you go for the ezekis primarily <laughs> uh yeah we have um, fleet procurement rules and stuff like that so we don't really get to uh to pick. We, we say this is what we want and we go to our fleet manager and they go out to the market and they will look at the frameworks that we've got there for the different machines that do this kind of stuff and it generally comes down to a balance between cost and you know what's going to work and yeah we we went we went down this route and so far from speaking to the operatives they've been they've been very happy and and it, it's working well so yeah it depends i think this is another element of working for the local authority there's uh, there's a lot of rules that you've got to follow and when it comes to stuff like that definitely and there's if anybody out there is from a, a local authority or a contractor and you're looking at the comparisons between all of the different types of machinery out there there's a, a fantastic video that was put together by welsh local authorities for the wales biodiversity partnership conference um last November, um, which is a, is a great pros and cons that loads of different options. Um, and we can send that out or link to it underneath the video when that goes out as well. Well worth um, a watch. Um, goodness me, I think maybe there are so many questions we could go on all evening, um, but I think that's that's covered a, a lot of things. Um, and just to say that we're we're very keen to hear from so many different councils on what they're doing and, and more than happy to support the work that is going on um, and to showcase it as well. Um, if I can get my screen to share back again, um, there are a lot more, there's a lot more information on the Plant Life website. Uh, if you put in the, the web address here, um, 
it will bring up our guidance which you can download um, and some extra resources and a big map of lots of positive progress which I need to update because as Janet and our other um, speakers have said there is so much going on at the moment um, it's um, difficult to, to keep a track of it so if you do have a project that you're working on and um, um, want to tell us about please do and please email it three or three years. Um, and just leaves me finally to say thank you, a big thank you to all of our panellists um, tonight, to Ben, Tim, Liam and Joel, and to, to Janet as well. Um, we couldn't have done this event without you. And the whole ethos of the Road Veg campaign is that it is collaborative and we want to create a big network of, of everybody that's working on this to, to share knowledge and um, experiences and, and inspiration, really. Um, and it's wonderful that so many of you have joined us tonight. Um, if you've enjoyed this webinar as part of um, Plant Life School into Nature, um, there are other events up and coming. We've got one on um, tree planting, the right tree, right place. We also have one on grasslands as a climate solution, which you might be interested in as well. And we also have, um, for the more um, artistically inspired um, amongst you, um, we have a a workshop and talk session on using art to inspire people to engage in caring for the natural world. So those questions around perceptions of, of wildness and nature. So do have a look um, on our website and, and on our social media for all those in up and coming. Um, so a huge thank you again um, to all of our panelists. Um, it's been a, a pleasure hosting you all this evening. Um, and thank you again for all of your questions um, from the audience as well. Um, any that we haven't managed to cover, we might try and um, send around some answers to or, or put together a sort of tops tips um, uh, document to share with you after this. Um, so yes, um, and here's to, to more wildflowers on, on our road verges in the future as well. So thank you all. Um, and it's good night from us. Thank you.